Using this very cute little chipmunk, I'm going to share another 5 tips and techniques with you which will help you paint realistic fur in watercolour. Welcome here to my YouTube channel. Now I'm Paul Hopkinson, a professional watercolour artist and an online art tutor. I love painting wildlife, so if you've not visited my channel before, take a look around as you'll find plenty of content to help with your own watercolour paintings. Anyway, on with today's video, and if you missed the previous tips and techniques, I'll pop a link to them in the description down below so you can check them out later. So my first little tip will be to map out before you start painting fur. You find that animal fur has really a habit of changing direction at the drop of a hat, it really does. So when you're working on, say for example, with the front of the nose here, I'm constantly kind of referring to that reference photograph to make sure my little tiny lines for this first layer of detail are all going in the right direction, that's so important. Whilst it's easy to keep track of where you're going towards the tip of this nose, it becomes more difficult as you work in the bigger areas. Whilst you think you're looking carefully at that reference photo, it's very easy to get lost as you become absorbed in laying down layer upon layer of detail. The first layer of detail is vital though, as it acts as your guide throughout the rest of the painting. It acts as a base for all the future layers, and as long as the third direction within this layer is correct, your animal should look realistic at the end. Look all around the section you're working on and apply some small marks to indicate the direction the fur needs to go. You can sort of call this mapping out. Space these out and keep them as fine as the fur itself or they will stand out. These lines will act as a constant reminder as you work around the animal, but they are not going to mean that you don't have to continue to look at that reference photograph. They are simply an additional guide, an additional thing to remind you to frequently check that photo. So before you actually start adding, a density of lines really study that photo. It's quite difficult, particularly for beginners, to adjust this in subsequent layers. Before we go on to our second tip, can I quickly remind you to subscribe to my channel and click on that little bell icon. Hopefully you are finding my video useful, so you want to. And then when you run that little bell, YouTube will let you know when I post new content. My second tip will be to keep your edges looking furry. That's going to be quite unlikely that any furry animals that you paint has a completely smooth outline. So the chances are, if you look closely around the edge, that will be quite furry. So that's why I want to pull out a few little lines over the edge of the basic wash as we can see the foundation wash underneath the head here. And then we can just gradually start to improve the edge overall as we go around the head. I don't want it really smooth because it's not smooth is it? We've got to think about, we don't want it looking too combed, alright, so be careful with that. So this is also one of the reasons that I say not to preserve your pencil lines around the outer edge of anything that you draw. So make sure that those pencil lines are very, very faint. You would end up with an obvious darker line running underneath the fur, which would look rather odd. Now I do talk about this tip in a previous video. I'll pop a link to it in the top right hand corner and you can check it out after watching this one. If you apply the background to an animal, it would probably be necessary to kind of mask off around the edge and reserve the fine hairs. However, for this chipmunk, I didn't paint a background, so it's fine to add this furry detail around the edges. So again, I'm really being careful where I place these lines and working along the back. I know we've got the dark stripes, haven't we, on chipmunks on the back of one of these. So you've got to think about where they're going to be. But I don't want to go too dark too quick. Try to apply the detail alongside working on the different fur layers. You don't want all the hairs around the edge being just one colour and tone. This would create a coloured halo around the animal, which we don't want. Instead, add a few hairs each time you're working on an area by the edge. This way the hairs will be varied in colour and the paint will vary in consistency too. This will give a much more realistic furry edge to your animal, which will match in with the rest of the fur too. When you apply furry edges, always remember to end your brush strokes at the end of the hair so that you have a sort of a tapered finish as well. So start from the inside of the animal, 
tapering it and pulling away with your brush as you're going towards the background. So we keep working on this layer and keep working around the edges, trying to kind of get rid of any hard edges that you can see. And remember, try not to get a combed look on this uh, little chipmunk, okay? So just be careful with that. The third tip to think about is practice. You'd be very lucky indeed if you'd be able to pick up a brush and produce a fine, detailed, realistic painting right from the very beginning. Most of us, me included, need to practice. I still practice if I'm painting something that I'm not really familiar with. So perhaps a different animal, a different texture, or even a bird with colours I've not worked on before. I practiced this chipmunk's tail as I wanted to try a new technique as well. So we're all still learning, remember that. By the way, would you like to have a go at the chipmunk painting? The complete tutorial is now in my online school. So I'll pop a link in the top right hand corner for you so you can find out a little bit more about it. A lot of people feel really unhappy with their paintings. They look at other people's work or my work and compare. But they don't compare to how much practice they've had compared to, say, other people. You know, I've been doing this for many, many years. So, for example, I've been practicing my skills for over 40 years now. And it certainly didn't happen overnight. This is why my tutorials can help fast track you and I'll guide you around the mistakes I've made over the years and explain in detail how I achieved something as well. But that still doesn't mean that you don't have to practice. So take it easy on yourself. Be prepared to put in the hours and work at developing those skills. A lot of this is actually related to fine motor skills. So usually when you begin a painting in realistic styles, your lines are relatively thick to begin with. I notice that with a lot of my students, okay? So, but as you practice, you will notice that your lines become finer, more precise, and even more lifelike. Your fingers and muscles have learned what they need to do, and eventually, that becomes like second nature, really. I do have a video which looks in the detail on how to paint fine lines. I'll pop a card in the top right corner just for you. So remember, the more that you practice, the better you'll become. And also try and set yourself a little block of time just for like me time once a week. Anything like that, even if it's only for one hour. Just so you can practice different techniques and different styles of painting. And also in this case, working on the detail work and practicing trying to get the details all nicely layered as well. Because every time you try something new, every time you have a new go at something, the better you will gradually become. Because I've looked at my old paintings from many years ago and how much I've improved over those years. And that's all through, well, obviously, practice. Fourthly, you really need to think about the density of lines that you apply. Now, I'm actually going to take you back in time on the chipmunk to demonstrate this. The density of lines that you apply will ultimately determine how dark an area becomes. You can use this technique to vary those tones across an area without even changing that colour. Now bring your lines close together and more denser for darker sections as well. Spacing them out and leave more gaps between them for those lighter areas. I always like to kind of reserve those lighter sections, those lighter layers should I say, underneath the fur. Don't cover them all up. So as you assess a reference photograph, look at those subtle changes in tone that you can see, and also the number of lines that you apply accordingly. You find that some people like to do a graphite study of the painting beforehand. Because when you start to draw things out before you actually do the main painting, you get a feeling of the subjects, you get a feeling of the tonal variations, so the lights and the dark areas. And that will actually help you when you start working on the painting because you know where you've got to darken that colour of tone. You know where you've got to have probably had a little bit more dark area within one section. Without it making looking too black. Because some areas are going to be really, really black in a black and white photograph. Really, really black, jet black. But other areas can be like a mid-tone. So it's well worth doing a graphite study, or pencil if you wish, to kind of give you a feel of the actual subject before you make a start on it. Are you finding this video helpful? Can I ask you to click on that thumbs up button as a simple thank you for these free tips and techniques on painting fur. So as I'm working on this chipmunk now, I'm considering the light and the dark shades. So because I work on the paintings from light through to dark very often, I don't often go from light, dark and mid-tones as no some artists tend to. 
Um, I like to kind of work from the palest layers upwards if I can. I tend to find that when you start working on the midtones, that's when the painting comes together and you can start to see these sort of tonal contrasts, you know? So all this preparation work you've done beforehand when you've really fought through all these kind of dark and light sides, because obviously you can't have dark without light, you can't have light without dark, you need them both. Of course you do. So because you've already done that study work to begin with, you can see where it starts to come together, where the form and the overall shape of the chipmunk really starts to look a bit more three-dimensional. And obviously it's only until you get the darkest layer on when you really start to kind of see the, the complete form and the overall shape. And that's really when it does look quite 3D, when it really does look quite realistic. So you need to really consider those really dark and light areas, even on the smallest sections as well within the body. So when you're looking at the fur or the body area underneath the chin, underneath the head, or even on the top of the back leg, there are small areas, very small areas, which are actually quite dark. So I'm just going to put the mid-tone in there straight away so that I can gradually build on top of that as I go along. And even though I've got all these different layers on now, I still need to kind of soften this down with a large kind of size 5 brush. That is a large brush for me, by the way. Just kind of knock them back a bit. So when we get that final darkest layer on, that is when, that is when, you really start to see that realistic feel to this chipmunk. And that's when you can really start to smile. My final tip for today doesn't involve applying paint. It actually involves lifting it off. Now this has two purposes really. First, it's ideal if you've gone a little heavy handed with that fur detail and kind of need to sort of tone it back a bit. And second, it's also ideal for adding lighter fur details or highlights. When you're painting fur, it's really quite hard sometimes to kind of retain enough light within the painting because it's all very fine lines, isn't it? You know, we could use masking fluid. We could try to we could try to kind of reserve the white of the paper, the kind of traditional way of doing that. However, when it's so fine and so detailed, when you're painting hundreds and hundreds of lines, it's not something that's very easy to do. So lifting off is a good technique to use to kind of create those extra highlights within the fur and kind of reveal some of the undertonesy kind of foundation washes that we applied in the early stages. You see, while we did all the mapping out kind of process right at the beginning of the painting, um, it kind of kept us on track of all the directions of the brush strokes all the fur. Of course it did. But it doesn't really tell us anything about how dark an area actually is. So it's all too easy to get involved in the painting and suddenly, as you step back, you realise an area is way too dark. So what do you do? You just do the lifting off technique. And this is a technique I use on a regular basis with just about every single painting I do. Because it really is a good way of creating more of a kind of more of a three-dimensional form to the painting and giving those extra fine details that we need to kind of really bring it together. So in the same way, you tend to work with a fine line with paint by not overloading that brush, for example, and keeping it to a fine tip. You do the same, exactly the same thing when you're working with lifting off paint. The difference is really is that you want to make sure that you don't overload that brush with water because then that can kind of blob all over the painting which is not very good and you not get that finest line. And keep washing that brush out is so so important it really is. Otherwise you end up kind of transferring paint from one side of the you know chipmunk in this case to another area. So make sure you regularly wash that brush out probably every two or three times you lift off a line. Oh, and also one other thing to do with that as well is that you must also keep moving that kitchen roll around. So yes, I've got this piece of kitchen roll in my hand, all folded up neatly, of course, but every now and then I'll turn it around and get a fresh piece of kitchen roll. Otherwise you tend to find sometimes you're actually transferring the paint back on to the painting from the kitchen roll, which is not a really good idea, is it? And of course, this technique can be used in exactly the same way, can reveal highlights of a painting. And also, if these are really small highlights, then they can be difficult to paint around, they really can. So sometimes it's easier to work on them afterwards. And the process is exactly the same with a damp, clean brush and a little bit of kitchen roll. What you can do if you find that your lifted off areas are too bright or too big, you can carefully tickle around the edges or add a wash of colour over the top. 
This will allow the surrounding colour to kind of lightly blend into that pale area and then we'll reduce the size at the same time so it's a good way of doing that. YouTube reward channels with viewers comments so do let me know in a comment down below if you found these tips useful and whether you will use them in your own paintings as well. I'll see you in my next video to the right which is another video packed with tips and tricks for painting fur. I'll see you there.